um, I'm going to talk about maybe what's a little bit new and a little bit different, if you will. So we'll mention a couple of things about range of motion. I'm going to mention a couple of things on prevention and a couple of things on activation and strengthening exercises. So uh, it's always interesting outcomes, right? And uh, so this is a cheetah. This is the fastest animal in the world, it's closing in on its prey. And here's one of my ACL patients. Oh, nice. <laughs> and just outran the fastest animal. So I think I can speak to outcomes and how patients do. So a couple things to consider. Um, when we look at you know baseball injuries, and obviously we're talking about males now, opposed to softball. We've got a couple websites for you to you know kind of think about. This is ours, is American Sports Medicine Institute.org. So all the pitch counts and position statements and things of that nature that Dr. Andrews has generated, you can you can look at it there. Another nice resource, I'm locked up. There we go. Is the uh, STOP program that was mentioned earlier. Uh, the STOP program is through AOSSM.org. And what's nice about the STOP program, it's some, I don't even know, 45 sports. So some of the ones that don't receive a lot of attention, like volleyball and softball, their preventative programs are there as well. Uh, Dr. Andrews and I developed an app. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, we started it about two years ago, an Apple application, and the idea was that so many patients come in and parents and say, geez, I wish I would have known these exercises before, or I wish I would have known about pitch counts. In the state of Alabama, high school, we don't have pitch counts. It's gonna be mandated in about a year and a half. So that data that was generated at our institution that Dr. Andrews and Dr. Fleiss had championed, in our own state, we can't get it passed. It's just gonna pass in about a year and a half or go into uh, to use. So this is an app and uh, what mom and dad can do is sit in the stands, punch in their son or daughter's age, hopefully one day we'll have softball. And they just hit the clicker and when they hit the max amount of pitches, it tells you how many days rest. That's usually where people fumble the ball. They don't take the days off as a result. They think, well, you know, the pitch count, that's over. Two days from now, we can still go at it. It also gives them videos of exercise. I'm locked up again. Uh, another great one uh, that Dr. Noonan and Dr. Romeo are involved in is the Pitch Smart. And this is through Major League Baseball. It's a website. It's got a lot of pro players that are endorsing it, which obviously kids and parents like that when the pros say that. And there's a committee and they talk about pitch counts and, and uh, rest and things of that nature. So go to Pitch Smart as well. That's a nice website. So a couple facts. 65% of all injuries that occur, occur to pitchers not to pitch uh, positional players. About three quarters of all the pitcher's injuries are shoulder and elbow. So if you don't want your kid getting hurt, don't let them pitch. I mean, if they play a position, they're probably gonna be okay other than catching. So why do they get hurt? Well, pitchers get hurt at the youth level is because of fatigue, volume. They throw too much or they pitch too much. The other problem is mechanics, improper mechanics. At the elite level, we think it's other reasons. Uh, we think it's max effort. They throw too hard and their body just can't withstand it. Now you've heard of GERD before, Dr. Noon to mention that, we're gonna mention a couple things about that. About 83%, depending on your age, is due to bony changes, and 17% is due to soft tissue. So it doesn't mean don't stretch, it doesn't mean don't work on scapula position, muscle stretching, soft tissue, it means do all those things, but some of it is bony as well. And it's not hard to maintain your motion, and we'll talk about that as well. Locked up again. So pitching obviously is a very, very complicated effort. It's a full body effort, which a lot of kids don't get, get that. It's high stress, high angle velocities. Next slide. Uh, we say, this is generated in our biomechanics lab, that about uh, the, when you pitch, it's about 7,200 degrees per second. But realize that number is a little bit distorted. That's at the elite level. Most people are pitching non-elite level, they're gonna be around 5,500 to maybe 5,800 degrees per second. Uh, half body weight trying to dislocate your shoulder out the front, one times body weight trying to dislocate you out uh, anteriorly if you can go forward in the deceleration phase. I don't know why it's, I'm not advancing. So you throw with your entire body, about 60% or more is generated from your legs and the core of your body. That's why it's important for young people to work hips and work core and things of that nature. Next slide. So even at the college level, 75% of all the injuries are to the upper extremity. Slide. Uh, slide. 
So this is, oh, I'm sorry, go back two. I don't know why that went double like that. One more back. So this is some major league data. From 98 to 07, there was a two to one ratio, shoulder to elbow DL days. From 07 to now, it flip-flopped. The DL days are now more elbow than shoulders. Why do you think that is? Well, physicians and people have learned maybe shoulders will try rehabbing them. Elbows, sometimes people pull the trigger a little bit earlier. And you heard that in, in previous presentations. Next slide. So about 14% of all minor league players on the active rosters a couple of years ago had a UCL reconstruction. Average age was 21. That was pointed out before. <coughs> If you're young and you're having surgery, for you to make it to professional sports, which all mom and dad believe their kid is going to be, it, it's unusual for you to have a UCL reconstruction in high school and pitch at the big leagues. Next slide. 25% of all the major league baseball pitchers, um, pitchers that is, had a UCL reconstruction. And the age actually went up to 23. Next slide. So uh, again, why do people get hurt? Slide. Because they throw like that especially young people, they lead with their elbow, they open up, a lot of stress on the medial side. It's like they're throwing a pie. Um, a major league pitcher, a professional pitcher, or a lead pitcher in college, they obviously throw better. Next slide. So all these reasons, and we've looked at this at ASMI, Dr. Fleissig is really championing this with Dr. Andrews. It's number of innings pitch, it's pitching when you're fatigued, year-round baseball, types of pitches, improper mechanics, and actually big kids get hurt more than little, smaller size kids. It's probably big kids generate more force, probably, as a, as a rule. But that's been shown through a couple studies. Next slide. So sometimes dad has the best intentions. So he's going to play catch with Junior. Junior doesn't throw very well, but he's going to help him out. And uh, so dad's going to show him how to do it. And dad doesn't do very well. <laughs> and the problem with that is the son is going to emulate exactly how dad throws. Oh, no. And, you know, it's kind of a funny, you know, little video, but that's actually how some young kids throw. They push it, and they, they learn those bad mechanics early. So 17 million kids play baseball in the United States. I mentioned that before. We did a study with youth baseball leagues in Birmingham between the ages of 9 and 14. It was an anonymous survey, and about half the kids playing in that youth league had elbow and shoulder pain playing that year. Of the half that had pain, about 180, half were taking non steroidal anti inflammatories so they can continue to play. So you're talking about nine 14 year olds taking meds. Slide. So, as Dr. Nuna mentioned, it's an epidemic sometimes, and people have made cases for this epidemic. Next slide. So, these are all the risk factors, and you'll have it in your handout. Next slide. Next slide. So, again, maybe it's an overzealous coach, maybe it's a parent. It's like a parent that comes in and says, when you say take two or three months off at the end of the year, and the parent says, we can't. Well, I always say, no, I'm not saying you take time off. You should continue to work. They need to <laughs> take two or three months off from playing baseball and maybe play another sport, God forbid, maybe soccer, as we've mentioned before. So this is an interesting little uh, scenario from Sports Illustrated. Next slide. They looked at 300 home runs or more in a, in a Major League Baseball uh, hitter's career. And the big dot is 700, the small dot is 300. So you can see the distribution. Oh, go back. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Hitters, sorry. I'm not hitting the button, I swear. <laughs> so, uh, or I'm hitters, I'm sorry, go back. So you look at the from warm weather climate to cold weather, and you see a pretty even distribution. Next slide, please. Look at the pitchers, 200 wins or more. Most of the pitchers come from cold weather climates. So if you're from you know, you would think Arizona or Florida or Southern California, you'd be a great pitcher because you can be out there every day, great weather, but it doesn't show that to be true. Next slide. So this is a study by Dr. Romeo that looked at UCL reconstructions and where the origin was of the player. And they basically found that if you're from a warm weather climate, your age of your UCL is going to be sooner. The year's pitching is going to be sooner. Next slide. And they broke it down state by state. Uh, if you can hit the clicker for a second. So a, a maybe a, a warm weather climate that you're from is like Dominican Republic. Look at the ratio. Yeah. Red means you had surgery, blue means you're playing and hadn't had surgery. So it's about a two and a half to three to one ratio that you're gonna have surgery. Pennsylvania is a great place to be from. You're three and a half times more likely not to have surgery. What about Colorado? Well, a little bit more, where's Colorado? Hit that button again. The star will come out, there it is. In Colorado, a little bit more surgery versus non-surgery. 
Next slide. So again, you know, when you see kids like this in your clinic, it's a little disheartening and it's a little upsetting, especially if the parents don't get the message that this is not, you're not doing the right thing. You're not doing the right thing by anyone. Next slide. So here's in our biomechanics lab, here's a kid throwing. And he's really not that bad from a mechanical standpoint. I could have picked a lot worse, so I took somebody middle of the road. So he kind of opens up there, he leads with his elbow. Next slide, you'll see a side view of him, same person. He gets a little long here, but it's not awful. He's up on top, which is good. And right about here, he kind of loses it. Kind of drops and goes forward, but not horrible. You'll see a major league pitcher in a minute who, who, who has mechanics that are, are sound. So why does a guy like this blow out his elbow or have a, a shoulder problem? Well, we think it's too many pitches at 100%. Max effort. Just too many pitches in a game, season, career. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So if you look at this, this is looking at average velocity versus max velocity. The bigger the range, it, we assume this person would have a, less of a problem. If your gap or the range is more narrow, you're more likely to have particularly elbow problems, and these people have actually had elbow problems, unfortunately. Uh, so Romeo actually looked at this. This is American Journal of Sports Medicine this year. They looked at peak velocity, looked at age and all those factors, and looked at risk factors for Major League Baseball pitchers with a UCL reconstruction. And guess what? Peak pitch velocity was the number one independent predictor. Mean velocity, body mass, and age were secondary. Next slide. This is the problem. You go to, uh, you go to a situation like a uh, showcase where scouts are at, the first thing or the number one thing they're looking at is velocity. Everyone wants to know your velo. Wants to see how much you can amp up. How much you know, ball velocity do you have? So the message is a mixed bag, unfortunately. Kids see this, parents see this. If you throw hard, you're gonna be noticed. If you throw you know, with control and lower velocity, you're not. Meanwhile, you and I are telling people, don't worry about velocity. Worry about control. Worry about your mechanics. But yet the coaches are saying something different in what how they're exhibiting with scholarships. Next slide. Next slide. So here's a, a professional baseball pitcher in a biomechanics lab. If you contrast this to the kid that you saw, it's a little bit different. So look at the stride length. Big difference, right? Look at his hips. Look at the drive. Right hip connected to the right shoulder. Left hip opens almost like a golf swing. Look at the amount of ER. Look at his arm slot and look at the lack of internal rotation. Next slide. And that's why you lose internal rotation. Next slide. Uh, so this is a person that maybe years ago we would worry about. We'd say, wow, there's a lot of external rotation. We worried about the anterior capsule. Look at the, the GERD, that was mentioned earlier by Dr. Noonan. Well, the reality is I'm not worried about this guy today. The gain in ER matches the loss in IR. For you engineers out there, those angles are the same. Next slide. So GERD was mentioned before, slide. Uh, hit the slide, we're running, running tight on time, so uh, go ahead. So the adaptation may be good. This is one study that we showed, go ahead forward. This is one study we showed back in 2011. Three years, one protein prospective looking at risk factors as far as injury regarding range of motion. GERD did not correlate, but what did was total motion. If your total motion was off by more than five degrees, you had a higher risk of injury. Next slide. Second study we did, hit, hit it again. This was an eight-year study with one team. Again, prospective. Uh, we found GERD did not correlate again, total motion did, but ER was protected. That was weird to us in the beginning. We're like, wow, how did this happen? Next slide. Then we looked uh, at the literature. This is from the Cleveland Indians and Dr. Chicken Dance in American Journal of Sports Medicine 2011. 25 pitchers, CT scans to determine torsion of the humeral head. And what they found was the more torsion reduced your injury risk. Every 10 degrees of retro torsion decreased your injury risk by 30%. Next slide. And this is studied by Dr. Noon and this year looking at humeral torsion risk factors for shoulder elbow. Same thing to a degree. Pitchers who sustained shoulder injuries uh, were less likely to have the retroversion, or the greater retroversion, I should say. Players who sustained elbow injuries had greater humeral retroversion. So it seems to be protective at the shoulder, perhaps, but maybe there's a problem at the elbow, and we'll let him 
maybe he can expand on this a little bit more. I'd love to hear the comments on this. Next slide. So here's a number one draft pick, NBA, Kentucky basketball player. <laughs> Can't throw very well, right? Dr. Romeo and I were talking about this with guys who first pitch and they get out there and it's 40 feet and they throw it right in the ground. The problem is it's 60 feet, six inches. This is the mount. Next slide. So last couple things to mention in, in summary. You know, when, when I started, uh, you know, you, you, you don't even want to know the war stories. I was listening to a coach talk uh, with, with, with a great presentation uh, prior to lunch and it was just great to hear everything he had to say and the evolution of baseball. The first time I went down to spring training was, I hate to say this because I'm going to age myself, but it was 1985 with the White Sox. And we went down there with ISO kinetic tests and we got thrown out. The pitching coach got so upset because the guy said they got sore from ISO kinetic testing, we had to go home. They flew, uh, flew us back to Chicago, and when I landed, Dr. Boscar, who was a team physician, said, nope, you're going back down there. So we got back on a plane. My wife was like, what are you doing? And so we got back on a plane, we flew back down, we tested for two more days, and it got run out again. And that's how it all started. All we looked at was shoulder. And then in the years, we started looking at elbows, and we started looking at scapulas and hips, and that guy named Kibler started talking about hips and scapula, and we started looking at other things. But in the beginning, nobody looked at anything other than shoulder. What was your shoulder range of motion? So next slide. So the, a study that I thought was going to come up, but I'm all screwed up here, obviously, was a study by Curl and Joe, by Beckett. And what they did is they looked at kids. And what they basically did is looked at the relationship of the hip and the scapula. And what they found was, if you're weak in your hips, you have scapular dyskinesis. And if you have scapular dyskinesis, you have weak hip musculature. And that's an interesting kind of paradigm shift from where we first started some 30 years ago, where we just focused on one joint. You have to look at the entire body, work the hips. In my second talk later, I'll show the videos that we do with baseball players because of the, the timing factor, uh, but we'll get into it a little bit more. But nowadays we do as much core, hip, and scapula, actually we do more, than we do for the shoulder after shoulder elbow injury. So with that, I think just to stay on time, I'm going to end there, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you.